a lot of things we're going to cover. I know you got some uh, paperwork today. You don't often get that, but you're going to, we, we got, uh, Bishop's going to be talking over the next few services on the process. And one of the things that hangs us up is we get excited about uh, certain moves of God in our life. God does something, and then it goes on. And we realize we still got to deal with Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. We got to deal with people in our lives. Uh, we, we got, there's so many things you got to keep dealing with. So the process is very important, how to handle the gaps. He's going to talk about that when things slow down. So what I want to see in our lives is maturity, for us to grow up in Christ and keep growing in him. And everybody here is at a different level, different place. Some of you have been serving God 40, 50 years. Uh, some of you longer than I've been alive. And then for some of us, we've had uh, just getting started. Some of us feel like we get rebooted. You know, which is a computer term to start over again. So those keep on happening. So uh, if, if I, I try to remember, it was in the early 90s that I met uh, Bishop Gary, and uh, he was pastor, and uh, actually just started pastoring church at Greenwood Christian Center outside North Tulsa. And you were downtown at that time, Bishop. You were in downtown, uh, in an old part of town there, and you took an old building, renovated it, and it made it beautiful. And I, I remember watching him grow, and we'd go in and spend time with him and just communicate. Then he became part of my life, and when I started pastoring, and been with me ever since. Now, this is my 26-year pastoring. He's been a part of that for 26 years of whatever church I have pastored, so we're glad to have him back in. He's retired, which is uh, another way of saying he succeeded in one part of life, and now he's fixing to start another. Let me just say this to you guys. We stayed. I'm just going to take a minute to get on my soapbox. Just say, we stayed in an RV park this week. Uh, they brought, we brought an RV down, and we stayed in a little, little, little cabin on the RV park. I, this is a different kind of life to me to observe. These, almost every tag in the place was from up north. They had snowbirded down. This is their annual place to stay. They have calendars on their refrigerators that tell them when they're doing shuffleboard, when to walk the dog, when to, have, when, when to go play polka. Uh, when to uh, when to go lay out by the pool? When to you know everything scheduled for them to go, and and it was the same people walking the same dog every afternoon, and and doing the same thing and 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 on bikes and whatever. One guy showed up down there in a smart car, and I had to get in it just to see if I fit. Yeah. And uh, it's not real smart, I'll tell you. And so I I observed this all week, and that by the last day, H, I looked at the guys and I said, "May God kill me before I ever get to this." Because this is not what I would call retirement. I, I want to be doing something. And I'm not being, I don't want to be demeaning. I know that's their lives and stuff. And they live up north. And God help you, you ought to get some type of prize for winning living up north for a while. But I just want to live my life. I want to enjoy uh, doing the things of God. Amen. I just can't just stop. Amen. Sam, Valerie, I'm glad that you guys got here and you're doing something. You know, you just did. Because I know there was a time when you took off in that RV. I thought, there they go. And now, that, now they're back, so it, that's good. Two year, only two years was enough, wasn't it? Them RV parks are scary. Anyway, enough of that. Let me get off my soapbox there real quick. I'm just saying stay active for God. Yeah. Amen. Stay doing something for the kingdom. Don't just let it always be about you. Do something for somebody else. Would you welcome Bishop Gary McIntosh to the platform? Yeah. Thank you. Well, good morning, and God bless you. Great to be with you this morning and, and uh, with you this week. Um, we're going to be going almost every night, but Monday night. And uh, I just want to encourage you, uh, if you can, to try to come out as much as you can, because I did a handout. I wasn't sure I should do that or not, but I did a handout. Handouts are nothing more for you to fill in and then to take. I could preach messages, and you could clap and say, oh, and that was sweet. That was great. Amen. And then you go, but you forget most of what I said. So the handout is for us to grow in the process, to learn about the process. How many know you can't stop the process? Some of us think, you know, I, I, when Jerry says retire, I, I don't say that word much, but I have shifted and changed uh, from full-time pastoring now to 
to traveling, and I do a lot of coaching of pastors. I do a lot of seminars. I don't do a lot of meetings like this, uh, but the one place I love to come is to this place. And so I appreciate your pastor and you as the people of God. And it's always a joy for me to, to come to Little Country Church and, and to see what God's doing. And uh, you're just such a great group of people. I just love always my time with you. And so uh, I'm, I am staying fired up. Amen. But I've had to learn a whole different process. So even though I'm no longer full-time pastoring, I had to learn another process in my life because I shifted and changed in responsibilities. And if you don't learn the process, you get caught in the gaps. And the gaps can swallow you up, and we'll talk more about that tonight. But um, I, I just want to share with you that we are going to be working through if you miss a service, there'll be some gaps in your chart, so I encourage you to come out as much as you can. Tonight will be very, very important service, and we will be back here at 7 o'clock, so uh, make an effort to get here, and I promise uh, it will be well worth your while. Amen? Amen. So let's just read. I want to read a text, and I'm going to go to Second Peter, Second Peter chapter number 1, and I'll read from the NIV. NIV translation, if you have a different translation, just follow along or they might have it on the board. It says this, his divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything we need. Isn't that interesting? God's power has given us everything we need. I mean, yeah, that's just for church and spirituality. No, it says for life and for godliness, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. So, so to help us to navigate in life, God's given us promises. Now, I mean, know the word of God is filled with promises for the people of God. Amen. Come on, said those promises are for me. Okay. So that through them, you may participate in his divine nature. In other words, God said, I'm going to teach you how to partake of me and everything that's in me is going to help you in this life. That's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. That's a good exchange. Amen. And then you'll escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, then, and he, he, he gives us a process, and this is, I'm not going to use this, but he gives us a process. Make every effort to add to your faith. Your faith is the basis of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You're saved by grace through faith, right? So we've accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He said, so add to your faith. Add to your relationship you've established in God. Add goodness and to goodness knowledge and knowledge self-control and self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness love. Wow, that's a tall order. Amen. That was easy to read, but that's a tall order. And then he says this, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure... They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the worst things in life is to be ineffective and unproductive. You just go to a trailer park and do shuffleboard. You will be ineffective and certainly unproductive. And so, so he says, I've given you promises to help you to navigate in life to stay in the process so that you'll be effective and productive. Every one of us has to learn to do that. And so when I shifted from preaching three times a week to not preaching for three months, how many know I had to go through a process? A process. Things had to change. I was in the Word of God so much because I was preparing three sermons a week, every week. 52 weeks out of the year, I was preparing, and sometimes more if I'd preach out. And so I was preparing messages. I was in the Word of God. I was, I was in prayer. I mean, because I was praying for the meetings and all of that all the time. And now I'm not preaching, but maybe once every three months. And so I'm not studying the Word for sermons all the time. And I'm praying over the meetings that are coming up. And I realized I had to shift my process because my process wasn't encouraging my growth, uh, taking vacations, uh, 
watching movies, uh, going out to dinner with my wife, which is a good thing. Amen. But, but these things were not helping me to be effective and productive in my life. And so uh, that's a dangerous place to be because if you're ineffective and unproductive, you are in existence. And I hated existence. I did not enjoy just existing. Getting up, going to work, paying the bills, coming home, eating dinner, going to sleep, getting up, going. It's just existence. And there's nothing wrong with being consistent, but you must be in effective and productive in your life. And that is always in helping people somewhere, somehow. And it's not always in a church service. Sometimes it's in a grocery store. Sometimes it's in a seminar. Sometimes it's going to visit your neighbor. It, we, we try to make it grandiose, just make it simple but profound. I must be effective. Come on, say, I must be effective, and I must be productive. Now, it's interesting. The Message Bible reads it this way. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, Jesus Christ. The best invitation I ever received. We have all been given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. Your ticket to participation in the life God after you, your life in God after you turn the, your back on the world corrupted by lust. So don't lose a minute in building on what you have been given, complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate per patience, reverent wonder, and warm friendliness and generous love. Each di dis dimension fitting into developing all the others. These qualities, active and growing in your life, will produce no grass under your feet. No day will pass without its rewards, which give you the great experience you want in Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's an awesome thing to know that when you lived a day of life, something happened. Somebody changed. You encouraged somebody. Even if you were getting groceries and you encouraged the teller that was behind just, you know, putting all the groceries in, scanning all the groceries in. Something happened that was meaningful in your life. You were effective. You produced something. You don't have to change the world tomorrow, but just change a situation. It gives purpose in your living. This year I will turn 68, and, and, and I, I, I'm learning more about the process in this season of my life than almost any other season because the other season of my life had built-in demands. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't have built-in demands, but it has built-in demands for continuing in the process. Right. My relationship with God in this season of my life is more important than when I was 25. We have loved ones that have been passing away. We have, we have good friends that have been passing away. Things are happening around us. And I need to grasp life at a different dimension than I ever have before in all my living. And so I have had to learn how to stay effective and productive. He said, if you don't, you become, you become nearsighted and blind. Right. You can't see anything. And you're not grateful for what God has done in your life. Every day I found it absolutely necessary that I thank God for salvation. I thank God every morning that I, wo I get to wake up and that I know that I know that I know that the Lord and Savior of my life and the eternal life giver that, that has helping me to navigate in this life into my next life. Every single day. And the older we get, the more you need to be grateful for that. Or you become nearsighted and you become blind. You can't see life. So life just has you. Life doesn't have us. We have life. Amen? And we have life through Jesus Christ. And so all that to say that I've spent the last four years of my life beginning to try to figure things out to help people to properly navigate through life and its different seasons. And all of us have those seasons, right? 
All of us has those seasons. So we call it the process. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So really, over these next few days, I, I want to answer two questions. Is that all right? I just want to answer two questions. First, where am I in the process? That's the first question I want to help you to answer. Where am I in the process? That's called identification. Okay? And the second question is, is what do I need to do to move forward? And that's clarification. Let me say it again. Two questions. Where am I in the process? Because if you don't know where you're in the process, it's hard to begin. If you've stopped or stalled, if you, if you don't know where you are, it's hard to begin. It's like telling a runner, get to the starting blocks, and he goes to the wrong starting blocks for the wrong race. I mean, oh, he'll run, but he won't get anywhere. And he certainly won't finish because he's in the wrong race. So where am I in the process, identification, and what do I need to do to move forward, clarification? Okay, with that in mind, let me just give you a couple definitions of process. Number one, a process is a systematic series of actions directed to some end. A systematic series of actions uh, directed to some end. In other words, we want to accomplish something, okay? Another one, a series of changes taking place in a definite manner. A series of changes taking place. Changes are essential in life. You never get to a place that change isn't present. And we get to a place sometimes we don't want change. Just give me the same old, same old. But life is always changing. Situations are always changing. Weather is always changing, right? Seasons change whether you like it or not. Now, you don't have severe seasons in Houston, but you have some changes. I mean, when we go to 60, which was last week, to 20 this week, I mean, no, that's a change. That's a change. And so, so you know, but, but everybody still has changes. There's changes around you. The world is changing. Communication is changing. Cell phones are changing. Everything's changing, right? We used to have rabbit ears in three stations. That has changed, has it not? You said, you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I did remember that. So everything's changing, and so things are changing. And then the action of going forward is a process. The action of going forward. You have to continue to navigate in life. Every one of us, no matter our age or our circumstances, you have to navigate in life. And and retirement is not a retreat to nowhere. Retirement is stepping into your next, at, at perhaps a different pace than you've gone before. Right. Right? I, 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 my pace has changed. I've really settled down. My wife is amazed. I settled down. I, before that, before I retired, I never stopped, ever, seven days a week. You know, I was a workaholic. But she said, you're settling down. I, I like this man. This is fun. We actually went out to lunch this week, and it was all spontaneous, and it was good. But she, So she's liking some of this. Amen. Synonyms to process is development or proceeding or course of action or growth or progress or to advance. It really is not, and let me be clear on this, it really is not perfection. Thank you. I, I, this, I, I'm not giving you an equation that if you do exactly one, two, three, four, and five, you get whatever. That, that, that is ridiculous. And the people that do that only put bondage on our lives. It's not perfection, it's progression. It's not perfection, it's progression. We must progress forward. You being at church is a part of a process that's essential for your life. And that's why, unless you have the flu, you're at church, right? And sometimes even in flu, right? One of our band members, you, sometimes you work your way through it, but... But, but you stay in the process. It keeps you moving forward. The word of God challenges you. The, the worship of God uh, is an intimate expression of your life that, that's essential uh, for you to move forward. And so it becomes important. Several years ago, a survey was done of over almost 200,000 people in hundreds of churches across the country. 
And in this process, in different backgrounds, in different parts of the country and so on, and they found through this survey and all these questions that basically people landed in four different arenas or areas or, or progressions in life. And I read this many years ago and I saw this and I thought, this is very interesting, but there's more in this than just plotting people where they're at. Because plotting people where they're at is great, but plotting people where they need to go becomes essential. And so in this, uh, and you have your charts in front of you, and it rep is represented by those four circles. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay the foundation this morning, and then we're going to uh, we're gonna watch a video that I think is going to bring all this together. But the, these, these areas, I, I, saw, I saw a process that has helped hundreds of people throughout the country. And this is the first time I've really taught it as a process here at this church. But the first area they saw is there was a group of people that were exploring God. In the church, they were exploring God. It means that they were in church, but the church wasn't in them. They were hearing about God, but God didn't live in them. They were asking questions and they were exploring. We call that searching. They were searching. So these people are searching of, about God. And, and really, we need to make them welcome. Right. And, and you all do so well. But we need to make them welcome. They, they, they shouldn't feel an, as an outsider or foreign in the church if the church really is the church. We ought to embrace them. Welcome. So good to have you here. It doesn't matter if, if, if Jesus is Lord today. Just stay here and explore with us and you're going to see God. See, that becomes essential that, that we see God. And so the essential element, people element for exploring God is actually fellowship. It's the essential element that these people need fellowship. They need to be around the people of God. They're going to be blessed by the music. They're going to be blessed by the preaching of the word. And that's, that's expected and that's going to happen. But when I fellowship with people... And, and, and I'm hearing things that I like, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing testimonies of people that have been through some stuff, right? right? That's why being real is important. If you're not real with people, they think you are holier than thou, and you were raised in a perfect environment, and you, you had a daddy your whole life, and you had money, and, you know, they, they really do think that. But really, when you begin to share where you've come from and what you went through and how you survived it, there's a relatability that begins to pull them into the body of Christ. And so in this survey that was found of these, of these 200,000 people, they found that one group of people in the church were those that were exploring God. It's not a bad thing. No. Even if you're here this morning, that's a great thing. You're in the right place at the right time among the right people. Amen? Amen. Say exploring God. exploring God. The second area is those that are beginning in God. Those that are beginning in God. These are people that have started a relationship with Jesus Christ, and now the key word is they're inquiring. They're inquiring. Because this is a whole different world. This is a whole different world. You might be 48 years old, just received Jesus Christ yesterday, and you're a baby in Christ. Right? You're a baby in Christ. Well, I'm not a baby. Well, in Christ you are. You've just been born again or born from above, born in Christ and Christ in you. And, and it becomes a wonderful thing, but, but the whole kingdom of God is a weird thing. I used to have been taught to fight, now i got to love. Now, you still have an enemy, and you do fight him, right? But if you're a fighter, that's a good thing. But, but you understand, so, so, so the word is different. I used to take, and now they're telling me to give. It's just a different world, and so now I have to learn. So I have to inquire in God. I have to inquire what, what is the right thing. A friend of uh, Pastor Jerry and I uh, had, was having testimony service, and this one guy had just got saved about a week ago, and they were having testimony service, and people, several people gave a testimony, and, and, and Pastor called him forward and he said, Brother so-and-so, come here. And he said, just, just pray out and curse the devil. And he went, Blankety, 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 and started cursing the devil. He didn't know any better. He, just, he started cussing and used every word that could ever be imagined. 
Well, he was beginning in God. He t- the pastor told him to curse God, so he cursed God. Cursed the devil, I mean. He cursed the devil. It, 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 was, an ama- it was an amazing thing. But, but it's, it's, you're inquiring, you're learning, you're, everything's new and everything's fresh, and you have to be open and receptive. You have to watch and listen and observe. And the, the people element of this is relationship. Relationship. We have to have relationship with one another. This, you cannot be a hermit Christian. And even though some of you may be introverts and some extroverts and all that's good, it's, it's who God made you, it's, it's all right. But you got to have some people you relate to. We have to have not only a relationship with God, but a relationship with people. Relationship with people. And you all, you all have relationship with one another. That's what makes this church wonderful. Because you come to church and you see people, you know, how you do, man, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks or whatever. And that's relationship. Relationships is key. In fact, George Bonner's church statistician says, if you don't develop three relationships within three months, you'll leave the church. You need at least three relationships, three people that you know, go out, go out to dinner with one another, do something, right? Develop a relationship, come to the men's meeting, come to the women's meeting, whatever it is, and, and meet some people. Find some people that do things that you like to do, you know, and then do it with them. It's relationship building, and it's beginning in God. There was a whole group of people that were in this process. They were beginning in God, okay? Number three are those that were close to God. By the way, and this isn't in the notes, but you can put it down. Uh, A great biblical example of exploring God was Nicodemus. That's a biblical example, Nicodemus. You can just write that anywhere on there, but Nicodemus. The one beginning of God was the woman at the well. Remember, she had this encounter with God, and he said, give me a drink. And she said, you know, all this. And so finally, he started talking about her whole life and what she had been through and what she was doing right then. And she ran back to the city and said, come see a man. That told me everything about my life. I met a man that began to change my life. I was, he, he, I was going to give him water, but he was going to give me eternal water that I'd never thirst again. So that was a woman at the well. Close to God, close to God. This is interesting. Those that are close to God are essential. And so what they do is they're learning now. They're learning. And this relationship is discipleship. Discipleship. Discipleship is not necessarily a class, though it certainly can be a class as part of its process. But it becomes important that now we be learners, that we're sitting in church and we're hearing what the pastor says because now it's clear. It used to be really good and and love Pastor Jerry's uh, personality and he's exciting and motivating and I'd get something and I'd feel good, but now I'm hearing tidbits that he is saying And I'm learning how to take them and apply them to my life. Things begin to shift at that point in your life. And so discipleship becomes important. And discipleship actually means, disciple means learner. One who is growing. One who is growing and learning. In other words, I I know more than John 3.16. Amen. Because we used to quote that when we were heathens, right? So I know John 3.16. And so, so it's, it's, it's. It's going to the next level. It's, it's, it's coming on, on Tuesday nights because, because there, Pastor Jerry just breaks the word down at a whole different level, and I'm, I'm getting some things, and he's doing a series on such and such, and I'm taking it home. My wife and I are discussing, or brother and I are discussing it, and we're, we're, we're learning how to make application of that truth into our lives because it is truth, and truth really does set you free, Right? right? The Bible says, you shall know the truth. And one translation says, and the truth you know shall set you free. So, so, so when, you, when you begin to make application, which is the whole process of discipleship, things at that point begin to shift in your entire life. They begin to shift. And number four, number four is God-centered. God-centered. God-centered is an interesting thing. If I were to draw a piece of pie... And you were to cut that piece of pie, which you all can make around here. I've had several. But if you cut that piece of pie and you give a piece, that's a piece of pie. And sometimes our life is like that. Like we have our work life. We have our home life. We have our 
church life, we have our financial life, we have our recreation life, and so we break it down in pieces of pie. But when you move into this fourth area, it means that you cut the center of the pie out and you call it God. So that every piece you cut is centered in God. So now God's a part of my work life. Because I do work to make money, but there are people that I work with that need God. Right? So now he comes into my recreation life because I like to do things and I go hunting with so-and-so. But so-and-so doesn't know God. And so now I get to hunt, but we're going to be out there for several days. But we're going to talk about some real life issues. You know, everything. And so my money is my money, and I handle my money, but now God's the center of my money because his name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides, which means my job is not only is not my only form of income. God can take 90%, which is 100 minus the tithe, which is 90%, and make 90% far more than 100% ever could be. So he's the center of everything. It's God-centered. God-centered, all right? And the word that goes along with that is leading. This is where leadership really begins to take place when you're God-centered. Then you begin to lead. Leading is different. Leading is not being served. Leading is served. And so in our church, when we talk about the term leadership, leadership is never said without servant in front of it. So we only have servant leaders. Because a leader and a title only tells you how you serve. That's all it does. If, if, you're, if you're a porter in the house or an usher in the house, then, then you help serve the order of the house and the seating of the people. If you're a greeter, then you welcome the people in. And so that's how you serve people. And so all of us become leaders then. And we're, we need leadership in our life, which, of course, is your pastor and the, lead, and the pastoral team is the leadership of the house. And you need those people in your life. This is the basic outline of the process. Your goal is to figure out where you are. And let me help you. It doesn't matter that anybody know, has to know where you're at except you. If you are not self-aware, it's hard to start the process. It's hard to start the process. If you're exploring God, then you're listening this morning. You may have been listening the last several weeks. And so maybe you're at a point where you say, you know what? I like this thing. I like what I'm hearing. I like the people I'm meeting. I want to be a part of this. I need to invite Jesus to become Lord and Savior of my life. Maybe you're at that point, or maybe you're beginning in God. You've been on the outside. You've been looking in. You come to church here and there and now and then, and and now you're coming a little more consistently. And so now you're beginning to inquire, and you're building a couple of relationships that are very meaningful. Or maybe you're close to God and you're learning now and, and you're reading some books outside of church that pastor's talking about and so on. And, and uh, you're, you're just learning at a different level. Uh, you are really becoming one who, who is grasping this thing. And now when you're reading the word, the word seems to jump out. And, well, I never heard that. I've been given everything I need for life and godliness through Jesus, my knowledge of Jesus Christ. Wow, that's cool. What does that mean? And how do I apply that? And so on. And so now you're close to God and you're in the process of becoming a learner. And maybe you're about to step into leadership. It means God's the center. God's the center. He really is the center. He's the center. I, I, I heard a person teach on the heart. And I'm closing, but I heard a person teaching on the heart. And so he showed all these illustrations of the heart. He showed a heart, and then he showed a red heart, Valentine's heart, and all these things. And he said, well, I think this is the heart, but the heart is the command center. And he showed, he showed Captain Kirk on the Starship Enterprise. And I thought, that's the heart? And what he was saying is, it's the command center. From this command center, everything of value really happens. And as long as our commander is Jesus Christ, our heart becomes the command center in which Jesus Christ rules and reigns. It's powerful. I want to challenge you, and I, my time is up, but I, I want to challenge you. We're going we're gonna to go through a process. We're going to walk through this. I'm going to lay it out. Uh, I may not be really good at entertaining you, but 
But if you'll walk with me, I promise you'll leave with something. Let's fill this thing out together. Let's walk through this process together. And I promise you, you'll end up in a place of very healthy and very strong that will change your life. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the screens. And I want you to see this little video, these two men.